<laughs> okay, I, I, well, I think we uh, need to get started. I would uh, first off start out by saying welcome, everybody, um, and special welcome to, to Brian Giemsma. Um, and it, basically, if you want an interesting read, check out Brian's website where he provides some details on his background. And here's just a little sampling. Um, he volunteered to live with form, formerly in, incarcerated people as an important part of his life education and hiked the Appalachian Trail after graduating from Notre Dame. He then moonlighted in forestry wetland restoration to pay for his law, law school education, um, experiencing um, um, satisfaction of seeing old cutover fields reverted to wetland forests. But over the years, he then saw those same fields hammered by climate change, which was his call to action and, and motivated his work with CCL. Uh, now his work centered on emergent convergent problems in human communi communities and digital space as we grapple with diverse, divisive communications. He's a conservationist and envir in environmental law, as well as a documentarian and a writer of both creative fiction and nonfiction. He's writing a book and is an associated professor of humanities and literature at Texas Tech, among, among many other things. So anyway, um, just a uh, welcome to Brian, and uh, I'll let you then take control, Brian, and go ahead and start showing slides. Well, thank you so much, Roger, and thank you all for being here. It's uh, really wonderful that people are taking time uh, on a late Saturday afternoon, uh, and, and I'm very honored to have a little bit of time to speak with you today. As we said, uh, not so fast is a good phrase. And if, we're, if I'm on to something interesting and you want to hear more, raise your hand or, or just say not so fast. And I'm happy to take questions as, as we go. Um, I thought it would be fun actually to, to start out with a little activity. Uh, it's one that I enjoy using in classes when I, I teach about uh, disinformation. So maybe we can uh, actually try doing this uh, together through the the magic of the, the technology here. Um, so, although, let me see. I'm looking at my, my bar here and now I'm like, where did the, uh, the share screen feature go? Yeah. I hope I don't lose that functionality. Oh, here it is, I got it, yeah, perfect. Okay, so um, <clears throat> let's start uh, with a little activity uh, together. Um, I'm gonna um, put up a, a poll here. This is a, an activity from a, a group out of uh, Clemson called Spot the Troll. Can, can you see that? Yes, yeah. we can see it. Great. So um, <clears throat> this is uh, the, the a profile of someone uh, named Harmony Anderson uh, as seen on Facebook can see she's got quite quite a few followers. Um, and you can see the kind of uh, things that she has put into her, her posts on uh, Facebook. It probably looks familiar. Many of you, um, you know, have, have seen exactly these kinds of things on uh, <clears throat> social media. And so, here is uh, my, my question to you. Uh, we're down at the bottom here. Do you think that uh, this is a, a troll or is this a, a legitimate uh, posting? And <clears throat> maybe I can uh, put a poll up here. Maybe you have to uh, put these up in advance. How, ma how many of you think that this is real? Just put your hand up. I know I didn't give you much time to take in uh, her her post. How many of you think she's real? Maybe there's a way, um, Roger, for you to tally the the well, pants. I can't see everybody at once since I'm watching your slides, but I went through the pictures, and I think most people think that she's not real. Okay. Let's let's go with that then. Um, 
that that overwhelming, overwhelming, actually. Okay. So people think she's a troll. You are correct. Very, very well done, y'all. Um, she is indeed a troll. Uh, she was a, a troll. This goes back to uh, the uh, Russian Internet Research Agency and election uh, interference in 2020. The signs here have to do with lack of personal info. Uh, some of her red meat political uh, posts are not necessarily proof positive there, um, but there are other telltales here. So I'm gonna move on here to uh, Christopher Warwick, who lives in Indiana. Concerned, and you know, this dates this exercise a little bit, um, <clears throat> with uh, election uh, interference and uh, sort of declining patriotism in the United States. Again, probably um, not a wild guess to say you've seen posts like this. So what do y'all think, real or troll here? I know I, I'm, I'm asking you to look at this really quickly. If we were in the first show, show of hands, be positively, you think it is a troll? Brian, would, would uh, if you raise your hand, you think it is a troll? Yeah, let's do that. Yeah. Okay. So everybody, if you raise your hands, we'll just take a quick look. Most don't think this is a troll. Okay. So let's go with legit. Y'all are good. You're actually uh, outperforming a lot of my honor students. <laughs> Although I can with some confidence, and maybe I should have started with one of those, point to um, an example that most people fail. This, this, as you would expect, you know, we look at this and we go, well, there are some things here that look like they really would have come from his community and, and, and that kind of thing. Um, on we go. But I'm going to stop that exercise short. Y'all did really well with that. And <clears throat> let's switch to one that's a little more challenging. Uh, clearly, our CCL members are, are smarter than the average bear. Um, so I'm going to make this uh, I'm going to make this even harder now and do one more troll spotting exercise with you. Let's see here. Um, for this one, and, and this ran just recently um, in the, the New York Times. Let me try sharing that tab. Um, <clears throat> and I may need to enlarge that. It looks kind of small on the screen. Is that how you're seeing it? Yes, it's a little bit uh, small. Is it getting bigger as I do that? Yeah, it, it is. It's, it looks better now. Okay. So um, <clears throat> let's have a look at this one together. This is very straightforward. <laughs> is this woman real or was she made by AI? What do you think? <clears throat> Same thing. We'll, we'll go with hands up if it's if it's a fake. Uh, or in this case, AI created. Okay, I can see hands too as I scroll through here. Most of you uh, seem to think it's real. So we'll go with that. Whoops. <laughs> so that one got most of you, right? Um, it uh, it was actually generated by by AI, so let's let's uh, let's have try another one here. What about this guy? Roseanne Friedman. Um, do you need to scroll down a little bit? I'm confused. There we go. Do you see a guy on the screen here? Yeah, yeah, we see it now. Okay. Why is that? Or there's there's uh, almost twenty people on this one. Uh oh, do we have two um, 
Yeah. I'm, Two rooms I'm, going yeah, in. I'll, there's someone else. I'll, I'll send them information. Hopefully, they can get the other people on. Yeah, I wonder, Roger, um, if when uh, they open up more enrollment for today's session, uh, it led to some people being in another Zoom room, so to speak. Um, anyhow. Should be the same number, but I'll, I'll, I'll hopefully fix it. Joe, I've got you, a... I just wanted Joe to take over for, I'm going to be offline for a little bit. All right. So people are saying he's fake. A lot of you, it's hard to know how you're voting here. So we'll, we'll go with, with uh, AI on this one. And that's correct. Whoever said that dude, the, the lighting looks a little too just so good eye. <laughs> um, the point of all this, first of all, is to get y'all a little bit involved in, you know, looking at these with a very careful and, and critical eye. Um, but also simply to make the point starting out here that um, this is getting harder and harder. And most of us, in fact, with my students who come in as swaggering digital natives, I can generally fool all of them in three tries at least once. Um, and I think that's really important to kind of the, the message and spirit of my talk today, which kind of gets into this way in which we're all subject from time to time uh, at falling for misinformation. I also want to talk about disinformation. And so maybe um, a good place to start, and I, I, well, particularly disinformation as it pertains to climate change information, um, obviously of particular interest to our cohort here. Um, <clears throat> So let me get my slides going here and we can jump in. And again, if you want me to linger, if you want me to slow down, please don't be shy about that. Uh, there are probably other people who uh, are thinking the same thing, in fact. So um, let me see if I can get this slideshow. No, that's what it did before. That's too small. Um, that's better. Is that displaying at a legible size for, for everyone? I'm, no. I'm not seeing it displayed right now. Okay. Can't see anything right now. Okay, let me uh, try again here. Just bear with me. Okay, can you see we can it see it, but it, yes, we can see it, but it does look a little bit small. Yeah, I don't know why it's, it's doing that. Um, And in the interest of time, I'm afraid I might just have to run along here. Um, and <clears throat> anyhow, this is important for kind of cueing my memory on, on different topics. So um, I'm not really sure how to get that bigger. So let's just jump in. Um, <clears throat> but I do want to talk, uh, ask you, first of all, how you just, if you, what, what is the difference between misinformation and disinformation in your view? We just jump, jump in. Yes, sir. Yeah. So, disinformation is intentional. Misinformation is uh, not. That's a that's a great simple way to put it, and it's a it's a it's an important distinction in certain respects when we talk about um, climate change disinformation, uh, in particular. So, uh, we did our interactive here. Um, I want to give an example of, um, you know, sort of how uh, disinformation can be used to persuade people, because I'm also going to talk briefly, at least, about how that pertains to climate change. There's quite a, an interesting and, and longish uh, history there. But this slide uh, shows you a really fascinating thing that happened. These researchers were looking at- Hey, this is, this is Jane. I can't see the screen. Uh, we can I see it. It's just, it's just small. But don't don't back it. talk me. Don't back talk me, Joe. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, I had these like going full screen 
earlier. Let me let me try one more time. I'm stopping it. Um, and I'm going to share that screen uh, again. If people are having trouble uh, seeing it. This is what I get for being so reliant on technology. The same technologies that uh, deliver misinformation and disinformation. Are, are you starting over also? Because a number of us were on a different line and we just switched over. I see. Larry, just not to do that at this point. You're you're not missing much, Larry. I promise. <laughs> we're just getting warmed up. Um, <clears throat> well, why don't we get started? Yeah. Once again, uh, unfortunately, as soon as I try to share it, it, it gets small on the screen. So I'm going to run, run ahead with this. But if you see something that looks sort of like, uh, I don't know, a, a cancer uh, metastasizing, some kind of scan like that, in a way, that's kind of what that did. Because researchers were looking at the dialogue around Black Lives Matter, and they were capturing the, the, twi the tweets about this. And they saw something kind of weird going on over time. They noticed that the dialogue <clears throat> became more and more partisan. Um, if in the middle of this slide, you imagine a, an axis of neutrality. Yeah, this is literally fuck all you. It says left leaning on one side, right leaning on the other. What happened was uh, they noticed that the positions started to, to fan out. Uh, just like they look on the scatter plot, what the orange nodes are in there were troll farms. Um, they were deliberately embedded uh, around the time of BLM to uh, really foster more and more extreme opinion. And the troll farmers, so to speak, didn't care one bit about the uh, political positions there. Um, Hey, this is Ty Gribble. Can Glenn please wake up? No, no sleeping. Please. Okay. Well, something's going on. We're up to 43 uh, people in here. That's good. Okay. So, um, on we go. Uh, <clears throat> anyhow, as you can see, those nodes uh, were actually, they did metastasize because of the troll farms. And <clears throat> it's a fascinating example of how the dialogue around a subject uh, became more and more extreme because of disinformation. All right, let me move along here. Let me get back to my, my slides. Um, <clears throat> I wanna see you get butt booty. Yeah, it sounds like we have a troll in here. That's a pity. All right, <laughs> I, I planned this, y'all. It's a, an illustration of uh, our life in the disinfosphere. Um, the disinfosphere is my own term of art for our kind of involuntary consignment um, to uh, living in a world that's full of digital misinformation and sometimes disinformation that's designed uh, specifically to, to foster division. Now, right here in Lubbock, we had a really interesting example of this come up. Um, it's called pink slime journalism. Uh, pink slime journalism is probably a new term to most people. It is uh, just like what you might think. If you think of a hot dog, there's this stuff that they put into it. Um, it's sort Todd of- Gribble popping in here again. Cheryl is a op. <laughs> Would you request that folks um, uh, mute themselves, please? We could mute all. Yeah, it, I think we have actual trolls in our, our midst here who are deliberately disrupting this talk, unfortunately. Hey, hey Carol, how, how about you shut up? Yeah, Carol's being rude. Whoever, whoever this person Carol is, uh, yeah. Okay, so I'm going to carry on, y'all, because that's about all I can do here. And 
Uh, Hi, I just uh, wanted to say um, I'm Susan uh, Adams intern. Uh, if you need help moderating so I can kick out these trolls, please just let me know and I would be glad to help. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. Carrying on here. <laughs> here again, hey, fuck you guys. Yeah, that. Hey, whoever, Mabel Travis, how about you shut up? Here are the trolls in the room. Yeah. Uh, so real-time demonstration of uh, people uh, who are causing a fuss online. Um, <clears throat> yeah, those people need to be, uh, whoever has the, the moderator permission, those people need to be um, removed. Um, I'm getting rid I've, of- I've just removed Carol, she's gone. Yeah, okay. Very good. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes, the trolls. All right, sorry, y'all. It's very hard to keep a train of thought going here. And isn't that the point, right? Um, <clears throat> okay, so pink slime journalism um, is when you see, for example, what looks like a community newspaper um, that is full of filler. Yeah, that is the pink slime. And these are largely kind of automated, uh, pay-to-play sort of publications. And it's interesting because many of them uh, have been backed uh, by oil and gas uh, interests. Essentially, they're designed to look like a local newspaper, um, uh, although they're not credible journalism. They're not vetted in any journalistic way. Um, and so, that the idea here is, well, for many people, uh, the trust in local media is higher. Uh, and so it kind of exploits the collapse of traditional media and moves into that space. Um, <clears throat> and so these things, uh, there's a, a website I could share with you. Hey, Gary, just popping in here. Does this man ever shut up? I mean, am I right or what? Shit, damn it. <laughs> yeah. Hilarious, yeah. Who is who is that that we need to remove now? Dorothy and whoever Abraham Esther is uh, has been disrupting as well. I'm so impressed by their antics. Excuse me. I do not know if I'm the person who is disrupting. I do apologize if my sound has been going off. I was just trying to sign in to see if I could get on my desktop. Hmm. All right. Fair enough. So, um, <clears throat> moving along, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> this is the example from here in uh, Lubbock. It was called the Caprock Patriot, and it kind of popped up right around uh, the last election cycle. And towards the end of its two-year oh run gosh, uh, in uh, Lubbock, um, it actually... Uh, uh, was exhorting its readers to, for example, uh, go to the Capitol on January 6th and overturn uh, the election. It was full of really divisive content like this. And I got interested <clears throat> and did what you do if you have training in law, for example. I said, well, what would happen if I followed the money here and try to figure out, you know, who's funding this uh, pink slime newspaper. And that took me uh, to the Oil and Gas Workers Association in West Texas. Um, <clears throat> this is not an accident though, that um, a lot of times there's a, there's a lot of troll activity, not just around climate disinformation, but generally extractive uh, industries. And in fact, uh, in the Mueller report, which very few people read, unfortunately, um, it was pointed out that troll farms and the IRA uh, effort to- Hey, Brian, interfere so with the most boring presentation ever. <laughs> very good. Um, <clears throat> so it turns out that um, they were actually um, targeting extractive industries because they knew that they were politically uh, sort of divisive entry points. 
And in some cases, they steered competing factions towards the same conflict point. Um, and I think that's really interesting, too, if you're interested about climate change. So anyhow, I could tell you more about sort of how I looked at the way that the Oil and Gas Workers Association worked hand in glove with the, the Caprock Patriot. But we don't have a lot of time, and I want to get to, to Q&A and cover some other things here. Um, suffice it to say that these papers are scattered around uh, Texas. This example from uh, near Amarillo, Buffalo Gap, uh, same kind of thing. Uh, it's just a, a sort of print version of the kind of disinformation that you see online. And there's been some interesting work, journalistic done, work done, real journalistic work on who's funding these enterprises. Uh, and a lot of them, again, are traceable to oil and gas interests. Uh, if you follow these stories, you might look at Tim Dunn and, and Farron Wilkes. It's well known that Tim Dunn. they're supporting uh, a lot of, um, uh, of these efforts uh, in terms of the PACs that they fund. So let's look a little bit more at the, the playbook here and specifically how it works for climate disinformation. The watershed book on this, or the landmark book, um, was written by uh, Eric Conway and, and Naomi Oreskes in 2010. It was called Merchants of Doubt. Uh, and it looked at how the same disinformation tactics were used as between uh, the tobacco industry and uh, oil and gas interests. I wish I could blow this one up because this is really interesting illustration of what I'm talking about, y'all. Uh, in 1998, um, the American Petroleum Institute uh, created this uh, science communications team, and they laid out a strategy for dealing with the fact that people were getting very concerned about uh, what you know we mostly then call global warming. Uh, I prefer global weirding like Catherine Hayhoe because it can make things hotter, it can make them colder, it makes things weird. But regardless, um, this is an illustration from that. And the, the part, and again, I'm, I apologize that this is really difficult to see, uh, but essentially this is where the title of the book comes from. Uh, the idea is that the doubt itself is the, the product here. And it was partly an effort to create a false two sides dialogue. We all know that that has uh, continued uh, to be an issue despite overwhelming scientific consensus, the climate change is real and it's happening. Again, I don't think you can see this, it's small even on my screen, but recently at the EU, uh, several disinformation experts uh, testified to, to, to the uh, European Parliament and they actually showed exactly how the tobacco playbook, which was used to suppress uh, the rising knowledge that tobacco is cancerous and cause, you know, causes cancer and death, that campaign really worked for the better part of 30 years. And there are very strong affinities between the disinformation playbook for climate change and that one. I don't know if um, this rings a bell for anyone, but uh, the, the first big freeze, so to speak, not the, the more recent one that we had here in Texas, this thing spread like wildfire, this image of a helicopter spraying a turbine um, during an ice storm. And this was used as a kind of to say, oh, look, you know, these, these renewable energy sources are unreliable and uh, they're not very good for the environment anyway. Uh, in fact, Greg Abbott, of course, uh, you know, actually made public remarks to say that uh, wind energy was a big part of the failure. Following the investigation of the entire matter, we know that's simply misleading and inaccurate. And this image in particular uh, was easily debunked. It was actually, it came from a European source um, and had nothing to do with what was going on in, in Texas in that moment. But <clears throat> the thing about these memes is that a picture is worth a thousand words. And this one image you know, was, was very widely circulated. 
And memes are powerful that way. And that's one of the takeaways from my, my talk here. Many, uh, m most of these divisive communications are moving more into the realm of TikTok and short video content. Uh, but memes are, are really powerful instruments in terms of propaganda. Uh, as they say in politics, if you're explaining, you're losing. And a meme can plant the idea. And uh, as you know, it's often credited to Twain. I don't know that he actually said it, but uh, a lie can travel around the world before uh, the, the truth puts its pants on. And this is an example of what that looks like uh, with climate disinformation. Hey, um, Brian, hey, this is pre I'm sorry to interrupt. Cheryl Clark has been private messaging me nonstop and I don't know if it's actually her or not, but I've just been getting messages and it's really annoying. Good I've awesome. told I've told her to stop and I don't know what's going on. Yeah, you're you're hilarious. Okay. Um <clears throat> so um anyhow. Uh unfortunately, y'all in real time I can't kick out the cranks in the the room here. Um but maybe someone else can can assist with that. And if anyone gets booted inadvertently, uh, again, apologies. Uh, but <clears throat> this this is a, again <laughs> perfect illustration of uh, the state of civil discourse in in our our country right now. Um, so. Let me wrap up because I, I do want to get to your, your questions uh, and, and get into q and I could say so much more here. Um, by the way, this is how uh, the Oil and Gas Workers Association used kind of off the shelf um, templates to create divisive memes. Um, <clears throat> I know that's a bit hard to see, but it's essentially something that anyone can go online and get and then circulate these, these ideas and, and images. Um, and now, and I'll, I'll kind of wrap up with this idea. Um, obviously, AI and synthetic media are going to really accelerate uh, this trend. There's a great example of disinformation for hire vis-a-vis uh, -vis oil and gas in Texas. Um, the, the consulting group FTI created uh, a, 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 what we call an astroturfing project and actually stole the identities of ordinary Texans online in order to populate their, their essentially their uh, advertising campaign or their influence campaign with personages, uh, ostensibly who supported Texas gas. Uh, it was called Texans for Natural Gas. Turned out the whole thing was uh, an influence campaign. More recently at the, the, the big climate dance, the Conference of Parties 28, the UN Climate Conference, as we more commonly call it, um, the McKinsey Consulting uh, Company was helping, shall we say, to shape the message uh, and working very closely with the hosts and the various uh, petro states who were in attendance. And this came out uh, primarily actually in European news. I didn't see much coverage of it here. That's an example of a classic Madison Avenue slash, I mean, it straddles that thin line between misinformation and potentially disinformation when we consider uh, the harms. At COP28, there was a lot of talk about abated fossil fuels. Abated fossil fuels are, uh, <clears throat> well, I won't go too far into this, but it's not clear that they actually exist. Um, <laughs> I mean, there is a way in which you can have lower carbon oil, for example, but it's very misleading to suggest uh, that we can decarbonize uh, many of these things. And the problem is really the framing of uh, climate solutions, in my view. Another example of this would be carbon capture. Um, I'll be happy to share this link to the uh, desmog blog. Of course, there's a lot of talk of carbon capture uh, at the uh, climate conference, 
Unfortunately, those technologies are essentially unproven. And in many cases, we're finding that they actually create more carbon in their, their implementation. However, it's a popular solution, especially uh, if you live in a petro state and you don't want to change. <laughs> so there's another link here that I can share um, from a group that specifically was looking at what climate disinformation looks like in the here and now and how it's spread by industry. I'm writing a, a book about this and I'm happy to speak more about it. Um, and we are going to see loads more of this, uh, especially since AI can generate it. So that being said, last thought, what's to be done? Um, you know, I always worry when I talk about this, we're spending a lot of time admiring the problem and it is a big problem. But I wanna suggest that just like the license or the, uh, the bumper sticker says, it's a case where we could do with a lot less bark and a lot more whack. <laughs> Uh, I like this illustration of these dogs because you have the sock puppet, then you have the dog beside the sock puppet, and then you have dogs pulling as a team. And I think that it's important for people to understand that. I don't think it's that funny, bro. In many cases, no, very good. Thank you for interrupting again. Brilliant. Um, in many cases, what you have, people are basically shadow boxing. You know, they're barking at each other. They may be barking at, at a troll. They're barking at an idea because they've been politically activated by uh, the, the kind of discourse and the, the state of our, our conversation. And I think we really need to pull together. Um, and part of that is simply by pursuing humility. We are all subject to misinformation. We're all subject to motivated reasoning. We want to believe what we want to believe, and we're more likely to perceive uh, information that's uh, untrue as being true because of this tendency towards motivated reasoning. Um, <clears throat> I could talk more about the state of play, like what works and, and what doesn't work here, but a couple of things I want to make you all aware of. Um, there is something called backfire effects, and so if you uh, try to disabuse someone of misinformation, you can actually, in some cases, prompt them to, to double down. And we could talk about examples from your own experience, maybe, where that's happened. But I think the same rule that applies for many parents um, uh, applies here, which is simply to connect before you correct. Um, Catherine Hayhoe, my, my friend and uh, the climate communicator, would also say, don't waste your time on the unpersuadable. It's like this with any change campaign. About 10% of people are cranks. <laughs> they are going to just double down on their position. You're not going to change their mind. And so it's really not a good uh, idea to waste your, your time and, and energy with that. Finally, I'll mention this. One of the only things we know that kind of does work, there are two things. One is pre-bunking. An example of pre-bunking would be if you looked at that climate disinformation topic sheet, you would see that a lot of those uh, bits of misinformation that industry was uh, pushing at the latest climate conference, a lot of them had been debunked in advance. And if you do pre-bunking and people go in there and they hear that, they're kind of like, wait a minute, I don't think that's right. The other thing that works well, <clears throat> and I've actually given you a small demonstration of it at the start. Sorry, I'm afraid I used uh, uh, human guinea pigs here. But basically, if you um, trick people, <laughs> if you expose them deliberately to some misinformation and then show them that, uh, just like getting your, your COVID shot or any inoculation, it puts your defenses up. And uh, you may be more resistant. You might look more skeptically at misinformation after that. So <clears throat> um, I could say more, but I think it's actually a really good place to, to end. Um, I apologize for uh, uh, rushing and uh, for, for the uh, distractions, y'all. Um, but 
let me let me hear your questions and and let's open this up. Uh, what would you like to talk about? And um, maybe we can go back to to some of these things where I, I had to sort of rush along a little bit. We may be getting into your 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 playtime too. <laughs> I apologize. I, I uh, it's been a it's been a little bit tricky uh, delivering here. So um, I don't. Uh, I guess the problem is people want to talk, and now everyone's been muted to. Uh, yeah, this is Joe. I'm, I've checked the security option to prevent people from unmuting themselves. Um, mm -hmm. We could have them raise their hands, perhaps. Yep, I see uh, Stuart. I'm going to uh, unmute Stuart. Thanks, okay. Joe. And Brian, thank you. I, I was going to start off with a, a humorous statement that there aren't 40 people here. There are only three. Everyone else is AI. But... Uh, <laughs> um, I'm I'm kind of intrigued. You you kind of answered the question that popped in my head uh, towards the end about um, using misinformation to fight misinformation. Um, are there examples of successful campaigns um, that have approached the problem with kind of a targeted? Miss or disinformation campaign? That's a great. Or, question. Or would that backfire? That's a great question, Stuart. I, and it's. I will say, even with pink slime journalism, um, you know, the overwhelming majority of that content is um, it's slanted towards one side of the political spectrum, but about ten percent of it is from the so-called other side. Um, and thanks for putting that in there, Larry. That's a fantastic book, uh, foolproof. Um, Sanders' book is is amazing. Um, <clears throat> the problem. So, when I talk about inoculation theory, let me stop screen sharing here. Um, when I talk about inoculation theory, that is exposure to some misinformation for the sake of inoculation. The problem is right now. I think we're moving towards this footing in the nation. And you can kind of see it playing out uh, where it becomes troll v troll. And I don't actually think that that is a good thing. So, for example, sort of counterattacking with your political perspective, attempting to persuade that way. Because what happens with all of this is everyone gets to a point where they're exhausted, they have no idea how we get back to a fact based footing, or at least some facts we can agree on. And of course, the admirable thing about citizens' climate lobby is that's really where we want to get people. Some experts talk about this in terms of epistemic health. Um, we're sick as a nation right now in, in that regard. People are less and less trusting of every kind of authority, every kind of news, right? Um, and so we have to, we have to deal with that uh, reality. And so I really believe that, um, again, coming from a place of concern and care, uh, attempting to be civil, uh, even when there are uh, difficult conversations, that is Catherine Hayhoe's takeaway is with climate change, the most important thing we can do is talk about it and try to find some point of common relation. And I think that's better than, you know, as it were, fighting misinformation with misinformation. The one exception perhaps is inoculation theory. I'll say, by the way, um, I don't know how elegantly I passed the test, but um, <clears throat> being bombed in the, the, the Zoom meeting, uh, you know, that's pretty infuriating and, and rattling. Um, and I think that shows in real time, like the challenge that a lot of us feel in our, our own uh, lives. Brian, there's a, a couple of um, questions in the chat there. The first one, uh, can you please share a link to your slides? If you could put that in the chat, maybe that's the first one. There's a question from uh, Dorothy. 
and the chart for the misinformation and trolling organized by left and right. Were there more trolls on the left? Or was that more just a display of the scatter of conversations? Um, that's what's interesting about it. Um, and I want to give you a heads up. <clears throat> it doesn't take magical uh, powers of prognostication to see that what's coming down the line that we're in for another big round of disinformation in an election year. And I would point out, I was gonna show you all an, an example of this, but I'll just describe it. A lot of these uh, sort of rabbit holes are being consolidated through social media. So you'll have a hashtag, this is a real example called hashtag save America, which sounds very patriotic. And then you go look at what's there, and it is just a stream of propaganda videos. And a lot of times, they're not particularly left or right. The Russians who infiltrated BL the BLM dialogue, they didn't care about any of that. They put one node of red meat for the left and one node for the right. And by the way, in that instance, like if we go back to 2020 um, it, or, or 2016, uh, they found that Hillary was divisive on the left and the right. <laughs> so they simply exploited that. And when you look at these sites, you'll find that often they're politically incoherent. You might have something that is ultra liberal in the Save America stream, and then something that is you know, very, very obviously conservative. And that's because they don't care. All they care about is a thousand small nudges that divide people, right? So I think that's the answer uh, to that question, um, uh, Dorothy, that uh, th there were largely an equal number of trolls embedded on each side, uh, if that makes sense. Makar, you have a question, please go ahead. I do. So first of all, Brian, thank you so much for putting up with all the, <laughs> the trolls. You did a great job. Um, well, thanks for putting up with that and sticking with it. I'm so sorry, y'all. Uh, yeah. Had to be but, subjective with that, but talk about an illustration. It, uh, it's yeah. not. I mean, absolutely not your. No, absolutely not your fault. And first time that I've been in a CCL meeting where where I've experienced this. Um, so so I wanted to 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 just address the, um, so this caught my, uh, caught my ears, was the, the, the uh, carbon capture. So there's quite a few of us who are on the line here, including myself, that are um, ex-oil and gas uh, people. And, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of different views about carbon capture, um, including that we will really need it uh, because you know, um, hydrocarbons uh, right now providing 80% of the world's energy needs, and we're yeah. not going to be able to replace them all. Um, so I just mentioned that not so much to talk about the technology or, or, or so on, but, um, you know, just to, just with the, the misinformation and disinformation that's out there, um, you can end up trying to counter that, but but countering that could also end up um, that you that you sort of disengage with people that are actually trying to help the situation, but in a different way from yes. you know that you may think. I'm, and I'm I'm not talking personally, but that one may think is is, is correct, right? So so it can sometimes be very subtle um, mm -hmm. the effects that come out of this. I I think that's a fantastic point, and and thank you for bringing it up. I I, I ran very quickly past uh, carbon capture. Unfortunately, um, you know, it puts me in a position to reduce uh, a lot of complicated information, which is one way we, we, we can inadvertently create uh, misinformation. Um, you're exactly right in terms of current thinking, you know, that we need to get to, to the extent that we must use fossil fuels we need lower carbon fossil fuels and we need to be capturing, and carbon capture is part of that. What was interesting about COP28 is in the conventional mitigation structure, um, many of the uh, petro states and industry representatives were inverting the mitigation structure. You know, um, 
and taking what should be final steps in a sort of phase out scenario and saying, well, let's do those first. And that can be really misleading, um, you know. And so I did want to, to bring up uh, that example uh, in particular, because I think we're going to be seeing a lot more of that. Um, let's just kind of keep going with what we had, like what was um, what Al uh, Jabera said. First, he started with a maximalist position. The science, there's no science to support uh, a, a phase out. And that made sense rhetorically because he staked out as much as he could, and then he could give back. And anything he gave back seemed like a big concession. And so similarly, you know, if you're saying, well, look, we're producing lower, lower carbon oil and we're doing what we can for carbon capture, but let's not talk about, you know, uh, getting rid of fossil fuels. Well, you know, I think that's, that can be uh, a form of misdirection. And uh, if you want to look at the talking points that the McKinsey Consulting Group gave to uh, industry, they were very carefully crafted to reframe the, the conversation in that way. What I would say, bottom line about all that is there comes a point when the use of a product is, is known to be so harmful uh, that, you know, we get into an ethical calculus. And often that's the line between misinformation and disinformation. For example, if your doctor said, look, don't worry about smoking, it's, it's fine. <laughs> you know, you probably have some ethical questions and you probably say uh, that's disinformation. Um, I think the question we all need to ask ourselves is at this moment in history, um, knowing what we know, again, no one's saying that tomorrow we can flip that switch, but I think it's a useful question that we should all ask ourselves um, about where we are ethically, particularly um, in a very urgent moment. And I'll just say that. Um, I'm also trying to be, uh, when it get, comes to left and right, it's CCL. So I'm trying to be scrupulously uh, apolitical in, in certain ways. I don't want to put anyone off here, um, but you can rest assured that they're going to be, uh, there's, we're gonna see a lot of misleading industry information. And I'm kind of a skeptic about what happened at the COP28 on the level that um, I think reframing the message worked really well for industry. Um, and it's a year when there were record profits. Um, it's a year when there's record uh, spending on uh, subsidies. We're spending more, the, the industry, the subsidy per person globally is a lot more than education. And so uh, some of my friends who work in the sphere are saying, well, is, is this really the industry saying we're not even going to pretend to play ball anymore? Um, and so anyhow, I'll throw that out there as well. Yeah. This could be a very long conversation, so, but thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank, thank you so much for, for bringing that up. Yeah. yeah. Larry, you've been waiting for a while. Why don't you go ahead? Yeah, thanks. Thanks again, Brian. And I had uh, recently read Full Proof, and I thought that was kind of an interesting concept, the inoculation thing. I, I just don't know how you you get it out there or whatever, and I guess that's part of the challenge. But one thing I was wondering is, you know, is there uh, any opportunity? Right now, the disinformation machines have zero, at least my interpretation, zero legal jeopardy. But is there something potentially down the road where, you know, the, the the spewers or the purveyors of disinformation for the purpose of disinformation, is there any opportunity for legal jeopardy down the road? I mean, you know, we talk about free speech, but there are certain things that fall outside the cap, you know, that are protected. Could this be something that evolves into that malicious malinformation, disinformation for the purpose of you know, uh, stirring up stuff, did that fall out of protected speech maybe down the road? Yeah, that's a great question, Larry, because, you know, this is the complexity of our particular dilemma in no small part in the United States. Uh, you know, the First Amendment has lots of protection for political speech. It has um, certain carve outs where there are, you know, real harms. And that's where it gets very difficult. 
Um, particularly, for example, you could consider in the EU uh, where there might be a blackout period in the run up to an election, say the week of, in order to prevent the so-called November surprise. Um, most Americans would be uncomfortable with that because of our First Amendment tradition. I wrestle with this a lot. Um, we have the traditional notion that the cure uh, for, for bad information is more good information. It doesn't seem to be working very well in our time. And in fact, there is a report that just came out. Um, they found, and we used to tell people this, just like we used to say, hey, industry is cleaning up. You know, there's nothing but carbon dioxide coming out of the stack. Um, you know, we can, again, have some humility about this. Um, not so long ago, the prevailing wisdom was tell people to do their own research. Um, Misinformation's winning online. <laughs> it's, there is, it is the critical mass. And in fact, the recent study found that people who, quote, do their own research are more likely to believe misinformation, which tells you something about the landscape out there, which I think is going to get even messier as AI creates the data set, um, so to speak. So it's, it's a real problem. And it's a case where I just feel like our, our technology is really outstripping us. I don't have a, a great answer to that. Uh, I am also a very firm believer in the First Amendment. And so when we look at political problems in this arena, um, it's really hard to come up with, with an answer that would work constitutionally. But we're weighing that against the, the, the kind of social implosion that we seem to be experience and, and experiencing. And I think that really is being accelerated, sadly, by disinformation. Um, you know, I, I kind of wonder if the, the thread that you found about the Oil and Gas Workers Association, if there was a threat of an $83 million lawsuit against them, would yes. that... Would that well, thank you, Larry, because I, I want to go back to that, because that, in my, my own research and writing, I don't Obviously, no one wants a litigious society either, but courts are a place of highest epistemic vigilance, right? Um, if you look, for example, at uh, you know what happened with Rudy Giuliani, I mean, being given however many million good reasons to stop spreading disinformation, right? I I'm more and more of the opinion that. Um, you know, when there are real harms, it's going to be to the courts uh, to exercise that vigilance. And we're seeing that with a lot of things that are playing out in the headlines uh, from from day to day. Obviously, to your point, Larry, I think courts are slow, right? Like there's a um, the wheels of justice grind slowly. And so <clears throat> the question that I increasingly have is, can our system even bear the stress test long enough uh, for some of these things to be resolved and for legal remedies to kind of, or, or I should say specifically civil remedies to do their work and maybe disincentivize people from spreading lies and disinformation um, where other mechanisms don't work. It looks like um, Mabel has her hand up. There are wiser heads in this room and probably a lot of uh, uh, good legal minds as well. Uh, but I think that's, that's such a great point you made, Larry. Um, and that's kind of where I'm headed with it. And, and uh, if I could just say that um, normally we would just, we honors everybody's time, but obviously everybody's very interested. So I'm just going to keep this running and then uh, we'll just, We'll probably stop 15, 20 minutes or whatever, but uh, as long as people want to stay on, you're welcome to. If you want to leave, that's fine as well, and I'll turn it over to Mabel. Well, as the trolls pointed out, Roger, I'm very long-winded. <laughs> they were right about that. And, and I, I do appreciate you putting up with this is, my first experience at CCL with this, and, and it's been a, a, it, a very trying situation. Thank you. Mabel? Yes, uh Thank you. Um, sorry about that with the trail situation. I did not realize I had uh, co-host privileges. Now I do. Um, anyway, uh, I wanted to ask 
I do a lot of tabling and I do a lot of grassroots outreach. Um, and I work, how do I put this, in a, a situation where there is quite a few, what you would, what some might describe alt-right individuals. Um, and my, one of my tabling techniques is just to listen to people talk, say their thoughts aloud. But I do, one thing I do notice a lot is hearing all of these sorts of, you know, wackadoodle conspiracy theories or that sort of thing. What techniques besides the ones that you have so greatly uh, outlined would you recommend in from a grassroots setting or yeah thank you that's a fantastic question and is your name mabel is that correct yes sir okay thank you mabel um yeah i think you're doing exactly the right thing um in terms of again this idea of just listening and being a good person even people who are very consumed uh, by this stuff, um, that that can leave that can be the most important thing of all, right? Here again, I wish I had more. I, I wish I had better answers. I don't think science has better <laughs> answers, unfortunately. Um, in the sense that, uh, for example, when someone is radicalized. And conspiracy theories are one way we see that. I'm sure even in, in the group that we have here, people know people who have been lost to them by, for example, QAnon. That's that's a real thing, you know. Um, and we don't really have, as it were, uh, great therapies for that. Once someone's consumed with, uh, you know, a conspiracy theory, and, and Catherine and I talk about this. In fact, there's a, a chapter in this book that I'm writing about it. You know, what are conspiracy theories for? Uh, they can be very empowering to, to people. And they, by design, reassure them that they're on the right side. Whoever was trolling us today, um, uh, they probably believe they're on the right side in some strange way, right? And these are the people maybe that you speak with sometimes when you're tabling, uh, Mabel. So um, I, I guess without kind of falling into leery generalizations about good and evil in the world, I think, again, for me, it's so important to deliver this message about humility. And I think you're demonstrating that beautifully. Every time you listen to someone, there's goodness there. Uh, and, and they may come in with an ax to grind. I'm sure this happens sometimes. And then you see they're a little disarmed because there you are. I'm afraid that all the digital distance that we have in our lives makes it a lot easier to demonize people. And then <clears throat> someone comes along with a conspiracy theory that, that fits you, so to speak. And you're like, well, I'm one of the good guys and this proves it. And I live in a fallen world that's full of corruption and evil. But I'm one of the good warriors and the world is against me, right? And I'll bet you encounter some of those people in those, those conversations. Um, I will say that the, the science, quote unquote, or the state of the research, it's, it's all over the map. There is a recent USAID report that said, most professors drink their own brew when it comes to what should we do about this? Usually we're talking about small studies. We don't even think about them in the context of a global north and south. We don't think about the cultural nuances. Um, <clears throat> we just don't know much about what to do, if I'm, I'm to be frank. Um, and the little, the few suggestions I have were pretty much those bullet points at the end. But I wanna thank you for, um, you know, so gracefully interacting with people who don't share your views. I wish more people did that <laughs> these days, yeah. <clears throat> Cheryl, you have your hand up if you'd like to go next. Um, yes, thank you. Um, so you were talking about how people who do their own research tend to get the incorrect information. 
And um, this is something I've been thinking about for a long time. It, it happens when you get experts writing studies or publishing in journals, you get it with lawyers. Most people can't understand any of that. Do you think it would be helpful if um, not just scientists, but others would write things um, for a more mainstream audience? I understand they're writing for each other. They have these very specific words and ideas they want to communicate, but it's also very daunting. And if a regular person is trying to do research, they're not gonna understand any of that. Thank you, Cheryl. That's, that's a really important point. I did run past a slide I was gonna share uh, a really wonderful group that uh, I'm working with um, that is called Good Energy uh, Stories or Good Energy. It's a, a nonprofit that is trying to do more to change the broader cultural narrative. They're working with Hollywood. They're working with other kinds of media producers to uh, deliver information about climate change and in a way that Maybe, you know, when people hear from experts, it, it just doesn't come across. It doesn't work. I, I put in uh, the uh, uh, chat here, that article from Nature, and it actually kind of illustrates what you're talking about. Um, I guess to some people, this makes sense. It, it says online searches to evaluate misinformation can increase its, its perceived veracity. A very uh, academic Pretty way <laughs> to say, if you do more of your own research, you're more likely to go down that rabbit hole and and to to believe uh, more falsehoods. Now, QAnon itself um, benefits, for example. I mean, that's the slogan: "Do your own research." Right? Uh, there's a way in which people are sort of seduced when they they go online. Now, how do we make that real for people? We make that real, for example, through popular media and film. You know, if there was a really powerful documentary, or better yet, a lot more powerful at the end of the day. For example, another example here would be, you know, we had the news this week, Taylor Swift, uh, people who made deep, Fans were outraged. I wish that the next thing Taylor Swift had said was, you know, okay, by the way, everybody go vote. <laughs> While you're paying attention to this, um, I have something to say. You know what I mean? To your point, Cheryl, like that's it's really powerful. I think we need better ways of delivering uh, these messages. And I don't know that I'm particularly good at it. I speak in a very wonky way and you can see how long it takes me to unfold the talk like this, I am absolutely delighted to work with someone like Catherine Hayhoe, who knows exactly how to reach everyone at once. Um, so anyhow, I think we need more of that in the world as, as well. Uh, do you Brian, have, uh, Roger, you do. You said you had like a game thing that you do at the end of this. I've, I've taken a perfectly beautiful Saturday. Uh, wait, this, 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 this does happen <laughs> on a probably at least half the time that we don't get to, and that's fine. Okay. Uh, we'll, we'll use the questions for next uh, next meeting. Um, I, I guess I missed some of your meeting because I was trying to do some things in the background, but uh, you know, one of the things you, you know, you talk about support for the first amendment and, and uh, freedom of speech, but with freedom of speech, I guess for, it comes with the freedom to just blatantly lie. Uh, mm -hmm. And it, it's just, it, it's so frustrating. Um, for me, and then what I'm worried about, and you t you talked about AI in the beginning, is kind of I see AI exponentially increasing that problem, um, and it, it so for me it's I'm going wow we're, we're coming up into a just this year is going to be horrible. Um, I don't know if you've kind of maybe you already touched on that. And I apologize because I may have missed it, but um, yeah, it, it's just uh, it's it's so concerning now that you can just do very little work and pull up some really good information and uh, build it to any kind of position that you want uh, so quickly. And, I, and I, maybe just if you could comment on that. 
I think you're exactly right. Um, and it's going to be, uh, we're going to see a lot of it. Synthetic media um, is kind of a, a good way to capture all of this. Any kind of AI generated content that passes is real, like those images of, of people that we, we puzzled over. But now they have their own kind of animation and they can be tailor made. But I would point out on the one hand, we might be disheartened by this and say, well, you know, we're just in over our heads, but misinformation and indeed disinformation, disinformation always goes before a war. I mean, you know, read the art of war, right? Like there's nothing new under the sun that way. What's new, as you said, is the capacity to tailor it quickly and make it plausible. What I worry about more uh, broadly is an inability as a society to have enough agreed, to, you know, a kind of set of agreed upon facts. I worry that we're not um, penalizing our political leaders for lying. And in the same way that as we kind of slid from say the fairness doctrine and journalism into the landscape of infotainment and then the web as uh, you know, new source, social media as new source. There wasn't a lot of contemplation of a kind of deal with the devil there. You know, what are we giving up? One of the things that we keep selecting for is free when it comes to information. We don't want to pay for it. But as with everything else, <laughs> you know, uh, you get better information often when it's curated and carefully researched. Um, so I guess what I would say is if we had sufficient, uh, uh, a, a sufficient footing and we have better civic and media literacy, if we did more to preserve and promote good media, uh, if we as a nation uh, penalize politicians who lie and weaponize information, um, I think that would actually begin to, to turn things around and even put us in a place where the AI content won't matter as much. It's sort of like if you lived in Finland uh, for, you know, they, they, they teach children at a very early age to be very savvy consumers of information. There's a good reason for that. I mean, they're on the front lines of uh, a threatening empire and they have to be discerning consumers of information. Uh, lest they fall into the, the spell of propaganda. As a nation, we've had a kind of digital Berlin wall dropped on us, uh, as I see it. We're all on the front lines now, and no one really understood what that meant, in, in my view, uh, as it was unfolding. I think we're starting to understand now and even panic a little bit um, because we feel this, just like you said, you feel this uh, viscerally, like, I don't know what's coming down the line. And I think we're all feeling that to, to a degree. Yeah. Well, I don't, I don't see any other hands raised. So this might be a good time to stop. Is it, it just give one more chance if anybody has something to ask? Um, once again, I do apologize about the Zoom bombing. It was kind of a new experience for many of us. Um, well, it, this is recorded. So, um, if you go to the uh, Third Coast Plus region page, there's under more info, all the cocktails and conversations that have been recorded are there. We'll have that there probably early next week. Um, and so many thanks to Brian. I, I just, uh, this has been wonderful. Even like you said, this is a real time <laughs> demonstration. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it, it's been interesting in that standpoint. Um, yeah. And then just a, a heads up for next month. Um, oh, yeah, for, particularly for the people that were sent to another room. A little explanation about that. So what happened was apparently um, Eventbrite changed their policy where they only allow now 25 uh, reservations. And then once you get above 25, then they charge you $10. And then Susan didn't know that. So I think that when the, the new address went out, I'm using the CCL um uh, like the Texas line, I think they were given the CCL Mississippi line. And so there were two groups of us on this call inadvertently 
I do apologize about that. Uh, we did the best we could. But those that missed the beginning, it's recorded. And and Brian did, as I recall, that was mostly kind of the where we did a uh, kind of a quasi uh, question and answer, you know, poll type thing. Um, yeah. Anyway, so next month, uh, we're going to have uh, Madeline Parra talking. She, she uh, had to postpone a month. But she's going to do it on deep canvassing, and this all has to do with the election cycle coming up. And the description she gave was, deep canvassing is talking with strangers in person or, or over the phone about hopes, fears, and aspirations. We reach across differences to build connections and build trust through conversation. So um, that should also be a very interesting uh, one, and I hope you all will return next month. It'll be February 24th. Saturday, February 24th at 4 p.m. again. So uh, we could all give Brian a round of applause. And, and uh, thanks, everybody, for just a very interesting, in more, more ways than one. Uh, <laughs> thanks, so. thanks so much for being here, y'all. I, I will say there's a lot of good research coming out. I want to leave you with a tiny ray of hope about how we can bring people together more effectively. We're looking at this in a dark way. It's a dark element of human experience. But maybe the best thing we can all do is what Mabel's doing and, and be kind and thoughtful and, and just start there uh, in a spirit of humility. I, I feel bad even talking about this on a Sunday, or Saturday afternoon, sunny 